The purpose of this video is to provide an introduction to the structure of biological membranes. In this video, we'll talk about three specific components of the membrane, and we'll discuss them from both a structural and a functional perspective. By the end of this video, you should be able to name and describe the structures of the components of biological membranes, to distinguish between integral membrane proteins and peripheral membrane proteins, as well as list some common functions that are performed by membrane proteins. So first, what are the components that make up biological membranes? So there are three major components. The first are the phospholipids that make up the phospholipid bilayer. Second are the sterols, like cholesterol, that affect the fluidity of that bilayer. And finally, we have the proteins, including those proteins that are integral to the membrane, meaning that they're embedded in the membrane, and those proteins that are associated with the surface. So first, let's talk about the phospholipid bilayer. So as you remember, phospholipids are amphipathic molecules that have a hydrophilic head group, shown here, and a high, two hydrophobic tails. So the amphipathic nature of those molecules allows them to form a bilayer because the hydrophilic heads can associate with water both inside and outside the cell whereas the hydrophobic tails are tucked into the interior of the bilayer so that they are facing one another and are protected from the water. So it's actually the amphipathic nature of the, of the phospholipid that drives formation of the bilayer structure. And here you can see another schematic. So if we zoomed in on these two phospholipids, we can see that the hydrophobic tails are found on the interior and the hydrophilic heads can interact with the water on the outside of the membrane. So in addition to this bilayer structure, it's important to note that phospholipids can also form circular structures like this bilayer vesicle shown here. However, once again, we still have a bilayer. It's just been curved into a circular format or a spherical format as opposed to a planar format. So now let's talk a little bit more about the different types of phospholipids. So there isn't just one single phospholipid. There are actually many different types of phospholipids, and they vary based on their structure. And because of, their, um, of the different structures, they actually vary based on their reactivity. So here we can see the phospholipid phosphatidylcholine. And here we, you can see that there are two um, fatty acid tails, a glycerol backbone, a phosphate group, and then we have a head group. In this case, this phospholipid is called phosphatidylcholine because the head group contains a choline moiety. However, here we have two additional um, different phospholipids, phosphatidylethanolamine and phosphatidylserine. So both of these also have two fatty acid tails, a glycerol backbone, and a phosphate group. But here, both of these have um, other different head groups. And it's important to note that both of these have um, amino groups that are present on their head group. Because of this, phosphatidylethanolamine and phosphatidylserine are both known as aminophospholipids. And these primary amines tend to make them more reactive than phosphatidylcholine is. So these, phosphatidyl, so these phospholipids all vary in their reactivity. So in addition to the phospholipids, we also have another type of amphipathic li lipid that's present within the membrane, and those are the sterols. So here you can see cholesterol, which in mammalian cells would be the most abundant sterol in the membrane. And cholesterol has a hydroxyl group on one end, so this is a, the hydrophilic end, and then we have this hydrophobic ring structure followed by the tail. So because of this amphipathic nature, cholesterol also orients in a similar manner to the phospholipids. So the amphipathic head group, the amphipathic hydrophilic end, the hydrophilic end will, be, will associate with the heads of the phospholipids whereas the hydrophobic tail will be embedded within the membrane bilayer. <laughs> 
So in addition to phospholipids and sterols, there are also proteins that are associated with the membrane. So there are two major types of membrane proteins, integral membrane proteins and peripheral membrane proteins. Integral membrane proteins we're going to talk about first. So these are proteins that are actually embedded within the membrane bilayer. And these are very tightly associated with the membrane and can only be removed by treatment with detergents that actually disrupt the entire membrane. Much like um, phospholipids and like cholesterol, these are amphipathic molecules. So here you can see a membrane protein and within the center here it's very hydrophobic so it can associate with these hydrophobic fatty acid tails. However the ends of these proteins that are found in the, that associate with the head groups and that actually face the cytosol and the extracellular surface tend to be very hydrophilic because they have to be able to be maintained in an aqueous environment so they're surrounded by water. So the these are also amphipathic molecules. And many times these proteins actually pass through the membrane several times. So here you can see a protein that's made up of several alpha helices that wind back and forth through the membrane. So these alpha helices would be predominantly hydrophobic in the middle, but then the loops on the outside would tend to be hydrophilic because they face the water. And we know that these integral membrane proteins that transverse the membrane bilayer do exist because of a very cool experiment called freeze fracture electron microscopy. And this technique, you freeze the actual membrane and then use a very sharp knife to basically separate the two sides of the membrane bilayer. When we do this experiment and then we use scanning electron microscopy to visualize the two sides of the membrane, we can see one side of the membrane, the inside, that has holes where the um, where those membrane proteins were found and the other side has the majority of those proteins present that were embedded in the bilayer. So these embedded proteins, we looked at an example here where we had several alpha helices that went back and forth through the membrane. However, there are actually many types of integral membrane proteins and all of them require detergents to separate them from the bilayer. So these proteins can be transmembrane. This could be through a single pass alpha helix. It could be through multiple alpha helices or there are also um, membrane proteins that are formed uh, by structures called beta barrels. So this is a series of beta sheets that form a barrel. Frequently these form pores within the membrane. There are some membrane, integral membrane proteins that associate with only one leaflet of the bilayer. And there are also lipid linked membrane proteins that basically have lipid anchors that are embedded within the bilayer. However, these lipid anchors are actually covalently bonded to the protein itself, so they are physically a part of the protein. So that's not the only type of membrane protein. In addition to integral membrane proteins, there are also membrane proteins that are known as peripheral membrane proteins. These differ from integral membrane proteins because they're not embedded within the membrane. Instead, they're attached to the membrane indirectly via association via associations with the integral membrane proteins themselves as shown here, or they can actually associate with the lipid bilayer. Now importantly, these proteins tend to associate with the surface of the membrane either via hydrogen bonding or ionic bonding, so because of that they can typically be dissociated from the membrane via a gentle extraction with salt which doesn't disrupt the bilayer itself, unlike the treatments that are required to release integral membrane proteins from the bilayer. So now that we know a little bit about the structure of integral and peripheral membrane proteins, I want to talk a little bit about their functions. So membrane proteins have lots of different functions within the cell. We're going to focus a lot in this chapter on the role of these proteins in transport. However, many of these proteins are also enzymes that perform enzymatic reactions at the membrane, or they can also serve as receptors that bind signaling molecules outside the cell and then transmit that signal inside the cell and that'll be a lot of the focus of the next chapter.
These proteins can also be involved in cell-cell recognition so that cells can actually recognize one another. This can be particularly important for, for example, the immune system that has to rep recognize cells as both self and other. They can allow cells to attach to one another and they can also allow, allow cells to attach to the extracellular matrix, which is basically the environment that's outside of the cell. So they can be very important for cell attachment. And we'll be focusing on some of these other roles, both in this chapter and in the next few chapters. So this is a picture of the biological membrane, and you can see here that biological membranes are actually very complex networks made up of both proteins and lipids. So we'll talk more about how these proteins and lipids um, come together to form the biological membrane and about the fluid mosaic model of the membrane in class. See you then.